Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so, so far we've taken kind of a big, broad look at both the old world and the new world. So we took a look at Native American society and culture and went specifically by region. And we looked at European society, kind of both worlds before they interact with one another. So what you want to remember, you have what's known as the old world, which is Europe, Asia, and Africa. Um, and then you have what's known as the new world, which is North and South America. And they're really two distinct worlds. They do not interact with each other at all. Pre-Christopher Columbus and pre-1492, there is no interaction between the old and the new world. Okay, so the time period that we're taking a look at is 1492 to 1607, which is a very dynamic time period because this is when the, the two worlds meet for the first time, interact, there's conquest, there's massive global trade for the first time. So it's a really dynamic time period. There's lots of things going on in the world. And when you think about this time period, remember in our class, time periods are essential, they're important. When you think about the time period 1492, to 1607, the European power that dominates this time period is the Spanish. Okay, they're the most powerful European country. They have the most colonies in the New World. Eventually, you have the British, the French, the Dutch, the Swedish, all these different, and the Portuguese, all these different European powers come to the New World. But the leading power in the time period 1492 to 1607 is definitely the Spanish. They get a head start, and they really kind of dominate a lot of New World institutions. Now, what we're going to start with is kind of how is this empire created? How did the Spanish gain a foothold in the New World? How did they conquer these Native American tribes? Some of them are really impressive. They conquer, you know, the Aztecs and the Incas, these huge, impressive civilizations. So how did they do it? And what we're going to start with is, first of all, why is exploration happening in the first place? Um, what's getting the Europeans interested in exploring the world and getting out there and um, you know, expanding their seafaring trade uh, and really trying to expand their empires. Um, so when you look at this, you have to take a look at what's driving this. And what's driving it is their interest not in the New World, because the Europeans, just like the Asians and the Africans, don't know that North and South America exist. They don't have a concept of the New World prior to 1492. Just like the North and South Americans have no concept of Europe and Asia and Africa prior to 1492. So it's not that they're looking for the new world. What they're looking for is driven by some of the things you see up here on the screen, spices. Okay, They're looking for more extensive trade with Asia. Specifically, they're looking for trade with what's known as the Spice Islands, which are right here on the screen, India. This is also known as um, the East Indies. And they're looking to trade with them because what you're getting there are these incredible spices, um, some incredible products from Asia, and it's it's the drive of trade, the potential wealth. All right. Um, now, traditionally, this all these things are traded along the Silk Road, which you learned about extensively in global history, which is a long overland route. Now, what the Europeans are going to kind of add into this, they're going to look for some more sea routes in order to to get to these Asian products and to um, basically meet the demand of these luxury products in European society. Now, what's facilitating their interest in spices and trade with Asia, you know, in kind of this 1400, 1500, 1600 time period? Well, a couple of things have happened. First, you know, it makes me think of the summertime game, maybe you played in the pool when you were younger, of uh, Marco Polo. Uh, now, this game that you play in the pool is named after a famous Italian trader and explorer. Now, Marco Polo is a trader of the 1200s, and he goes to China, modern-day China. But at that time period, it's controlled by Kublai Khan. So it's under the Mongol Empire, and Kublai Khan uh, is ruling basically most of Asia at that point. Uh, and he goes on these great exploits. He's gone for like 25 years. So where the game kind of originates from is he's gone for so long that when he gets back to Italy, um, people don't recognize who he is. Um, and that's why you play the game like Marco Polo. Basically, um, that's what people would say to him, like, who are you? Basically, you know, because he's been gone for so long. Now, that's just kind of a side story to Marco Polo. What he means for the larger, um, I guess, imagination in Europe is he kind of re-exposes Europeans to 
what's going on in Asia. And at that time, Asia is very advanced. They have huge cities. They have incredible wealth. Um, and he writes these, this book called The Adventures of Marco Polo. Um, and he kind of describes all these things that are going on in Asia and everything that he sees and all his journeys that he goes on. And it kind of facilitates the imagination of a lot of Europeans, uh, especially of wealthier Europeans, to kind of just see what's out there, see what's going on in, in Asia. What you have to remember, in you know, the 1100s, 1200s, Europe is still in its feudal age. Okay, you're still dealing with feudalism in Europe, very closed off, self-sufficient societies. They're not doing much trading with the outside world. So Marco Polo, he's important because he's one of the first Europeans to re-expose Europe. And I say re-expose because the Europeans had traded extensively with the Middle East and with Asia in ancient time period, the Roman Empire, um, but it kind of died down during the feudal time period. Um, now, he's your first kind of person that kind of re-exposes Europeans to this, but it's on a small scale. When Europeans get reintroduced to this in a large scale is during the Crusades. So you learned about the Crusades uh, in global history. You have these religious wars um, to try and regain Jerusalem for Christianity. And, you know, it's not just one war. It's a series of wars. They start in 1095 when Pope Urban uh, II calls for the First Crusade. Um, but they last for about 300 years. There's a, a, about 14 different crusades that take place in the Middle East. Now, um, one phrase you, your teacher may have used when you talked about the crusades, they call the crusades a successful failure. Because what happens is uh, uh, ultimately the Europeans are going to lose the Crusades. They win, um, you know, the first Crusade actually, and they're able to establish colonies here in the Middle East. Um, so right over here, um, you know, kind of modern day Jerusalem and some of the surrounding areas, they establish colonies there. Now eventually uh, the Muslim Empire takes back these colonies, but what it does I think is more important for for our purposes, for our study of the New World. It again facilitates the interest in trading with the East, trading with Asia, trading with the Far East, because things are being brought from India, from Southeast Asia, from China, and they're being brought over land route, trade routes, into um, the Crusader colonies here in the Middle East, and eventually it's getting to Europe. Okay, and they're trading with each other and they're being exposed to these great spices, these great silks and these great cloths and these luxury items, these dyes they've never seen before. And Europeans, especially the upper class of Europe who can afford this stuff, is interested in it. Now, if you look here, this map is giving you some good information here. It's showing you who's controlling the trade routes. Um, and it shouldn't be surprising to you who during the Middle Ages and during the Crusading period is controlling the trade routes. It's really going to primarily be the Italians, okay? The Italians are perfectly positioned geographically to control it. They're dead center in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. There are seafaring societies. A lot of the city-states are seafaring societies. And so they're going to basically be this middleman that's controlling trade between Middle Eastern society, which is trading with the Far East, and then the rest of Europe. So think of them kind of like a distributor. They're in between. Um, the Middle East and the rest of European society. It's almost like if you go to the vending machine at school. Uh, if you go to the vending machine, you know, and you want to buy a candy bar, it's a dollar. Now, to make that candy bar probably only costs like 10 cents, okay? But there's somebody who transports that candy bar to the convenient location of our school, um, and therefore each step along the way, each person who kind of handles that candy bar needs to make a profit. And so it keeps raising the price. So think about this situation. The Italians are kind of controlling it. In the Middle East, eventually it's going to be the Ottoman Empire who controls the Middle Eastern trade. Um, and the Italians kind of have this almost monopoly on trade with the East. Now, if you're the Italians, this is fantastic. You're making tons and tons of money here. Um, but if you're France or you're Spain or you're Portugal or you're England, this is not so good, okay, because by the time it gets to you, this luxury items, these spices, these silks, they cost a lot of money. Um, so this is going to facilitate the other European powers to get out there and try and find their own new routes to go directly to the source in Asia. 
And the two countries who are leading the way are Spain and Portugal. Again, geography plays a role. They're perfectly placed here on what's known as the Iberian Peninsula to go out and try and find an all-water route for themselves to go directly to Asia. Now, the first attempt that they try to make is to go all the way around uh, the southern tip of Africa to get to India and to get to the East Indies. And they do it. Um, the Portuguese kind of pioneer it and the Spanish kind of follow um, behind. And one of the major early explorers, a guy named Henry the Navigator, uh, and thanks to some innovations like the caravel, which is a certain, um, basically a certain way that you can uh, form a sail, uh, which allows you to uh, kind of go against the current and to go do things that you weren't able to do before. Um, this is going to give them some advantages. So you have some navigation tool inventions that give them advantages in, in order to, to make travel like this possible. Um, and so it just shows you that the, the other Europeans are trying to facilitate new ways of getting to the Far East. Okay. Now, this is kind of a, that was kind of a long explanation, but an important explanation to understand how does this affect the New World. Well, we all kind of know as Americans, we've all heard the name Christopher Columbus before. Now, his real name is Cristoforo Colombo, and he is an Italian from a part of Italy called Genoa. And he has a, an idea. His idea is, okay, instead of going all the way around Africa, let's, let's sail west. Let's sail west from Spain or from Europe, and we'll come out on the other side. And we'll be in the East Indies, it'll be quicker, it'll be a shorter route, uh, and we'll make a ton of money because it'll be easier to kind of facilitate this trade. Now, unlike what most people commonly think, the Europeans did not think the world was flat. They knew that the world was round. So that's not their big fear. Um, what Columbus makes a huge miscalculation with, and it's not really his fault, is that he has no idea that North and South America exist. And so when he sails west, he ends up not in the East Indies, but he ends up in what becomes known as the West Indies, uh, which we would call the Caribbean islands. Uh, and he really has no idea where he is in the first place. He thinks he's in the East Indies when he really, when he first arrived. Um, but this is kind of an interesting development in how this happens. And so he facilitates this new age, this new age of exploration. Um, and you're going to see tons of explorers are going to go out, um, some famous ones, uh, like Magellan uh, and, you know, Balboa, all these different explorers that are going out and trying to claim land. Uh, and Columbus kind of starts it off. So when you look at Columbus, I mean, we can evaluate him as either a negative or a positive uh, figure in history in general. One thing you can't argue with is that Columbus's journey changed the world. It absolutely changed the world because what it did was it woke up Europe and Africa and Asia that North and South America exist, and it also did the same for North and South America, and the world would never be the same after this journey took place. So what ends up happening uh, very quickly, um, within 20, 25, 30 years, the Spanish are going to go on massive conquests of the New World, and it's really incredible. We're not going to go into the detail of how they actually did this, and how they actually conquered huge pieces of South America and huge pieces of North America um, with very small soldiers, but hopefully went through it in global history. It's pretty incredible how they conquer the Aztecs and how they conquer the Incas. If you're interested, I would take a look at, um, you know, some extra, maybe do some extra reading on it because it is really fascinating how they're actually able to pull this off. Um, a great book that you probably read if you took AP Global was called Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, fantastic book, kind of explains how the Europeans have such a big advantage over these um, South American and Central American empires. But nevertheless, the people who facilitate these conquests, um, we're going to refer to them as the conquistadors. Okay, so the most famous ones are a guy named Francisco Pizarro, who conquers the Incas, and Hernando, Hernando Cortez, who conquers the Aztecs. Um, but you have many different conquistadors going out there. And what we're going to focus on is what systems do the Spanish set up after they conquer these New World empires, after they conquer these great South American empires, great Central American empires, and parts of North America, what systems do the Spanish and the Portuguese, who are also 
there early on? What do they set up in the New World? So we're going to start with Spanish political system. Now, what I want you to keep in mind, we're learning about the Spanish here independently, because remember what I said in the beginning, from 1492 to 1607, it's really a Spanish-dominated New World. Their competition in the New World in this era is primarily the Portuguese, but the Spanish have a huge upper hand over the Portuguese as far as territory, conquests are concerned. Um, but what you want to be able to do with them, you want to be able to understand the developments in Spanish colonial America, but you also want to be able to compare Spanish political systems to the English political system, to the French political system. That you really can't do yet, but you want to kind of like put this in the back of your memory because we will learn about the British when we come to school in September and the French and some of these other uh, European powers. So remember, what is the Spanish political system? And then keep that in your mind because we're going to have to compare it to the British, compare it to the French. Same with their economic system, their slave-based system, their slavery system, or their labor system, um, their social system. Remember, comparison is a big part of the AP, um, so you want to be able to compare these institutions one to another. So we're going to start with the political system of the Spanish. Now, important things. Religion plays a huge role in a lot of the, the conquests here and some of the drive behind the conquest. So therefore, the Portuguese and the Spanish are both Catholic countries, so the Pope plays a big role politically. The Pope actually facilitates uh, a treaty um, between the Spanish and the Portuguese, and he basically um, has both parties sign it, known as the Treaty of Tordesillas. And this treaty, which is signed in 1494, I believe, I don't remember the exact year, but I think it's 1494, what it did was it basically just drew a line straight down the continent here. Everything to the east of the line was Portugal's territory. Everything to the west of the line was Spanish territory. Now, you can see the Spanish got the, the nice end of the deal there. Um, they didn't really know. They had no idea how big North and South America were at that point. Uh, and so the Spanish really made out pretty well as far as the territory is concerned. They still had to actually go out and conquer these places, but you know, they, the politically, uh, it's to their advantage. Um, now, remember, one thing to keep in mind is that they are Catholic, and their Catholicism is pretty important to them as both for both of them, for both the Spanish and for the Portuguese. And they do believe that the Pope is the ultimate authority. And so the kings of Spain and the king of Portugal will listen to, you know, the authority of the Pope. Uh, the King of Spain at the time uh, is King Ferdinand and his wife is Queen Isabella. So those are two important figures. They're the ones who sponsor Columbus's journey to the New World. Okay, now, when you look at their empires, um, they're both going to facilitate some large empires here in the New World. Um, but what we have to understand is just basically like what how do they organize it? How do they set up the political aspects of the New World? Now, we're probably much more familiar with the British and what the British do. I and mean, then for whatever reason, since it's our, basically our ancestors, our heritage, you know, it becomes the United States, we think this is how all of the, the colonial powers organize their systems. In actuality, the British are very atypical. They're not the norm for how things are done and how you organize your, your empire politically. So what the Spanish did is they divided up their New World territory into what are known as vice royalties, and this is known as the viceroy system. So if you're looking at here, like for example, this is the vice royality of New Spain, which encompasses like the southwestern United States, basically Mexico. You have the vice royality of Peru, the vice royality of New Granada. Um, so you have basically four big vice royalities, and what the Spanish did is they appointed somebody directly from Spain to control these territories, all right? There is no such thing as democratic rule in the Spanish colonial world. Everything is from the top down. Everything worked from the monarch down, okay? There are no elections. There is no voting. There is no say from the people. Everything is running through the monarch. And so these people who get these vice royalities, basically like the governor of the vice royality, he's in complete control. He basically speaks for the monarch in the new world. Okay? And he might have nobles who he might kind of take counsel from, 
But ultimately, there is no system of democracy here. Um, it's very much kind of uh, a monarchical rule here in the New World. And that's important to understand. So Spanish control is very direct. It's very heavy-handed. Um, things come directly from Spain and it's controlled directly by these people who are appointed by the king, known as the viceroy, boy, viceroyals or the, the governors of boy, viceroyalities. Now, when you look at their political slash social system, um, again, it's also highly regulated, all right? And it's very distinct. So you're probably exposed to this in global history as well. Um, but when you look at it, the, the group at the top really has all the power in New Spain. They're known as the Peninsulares. Uh, and specifically, there's two categories here. This is a racial-based social system, and it's also um, a geographic-based social system to a certain extent. So at the top, Peninsulares are Spaniards born in Spain, okay? Meaning they come directly from Spain to the New World to control different aspects of the New World. Now, they hold all the key leadership positions. They hold all the high military positions. They hold all the governor's positions. Um, they're in control of a system that we, we're going to learn about in our next screencast called the Encomienda system. But they have all the important roles. Okay, your next group is the Creoles, which are Spanish people. They're Spanish heritage, but they're born in the New World what's known as New Spain or the New World. Now, why the distinction? That's the big question you have to ask yourself. Why is there a distinction between the Peninsulares and the Creoles? They're both Spanish. They're both uh, of European descent. Um, but one is born in Spain and one is born in the New World. The big reason for this is a, is a factor of loyalty. Okay, The Spanish want people who are born and raised in Spain, in Spanish culture, um, to go to the New World and then to facilitate and bring that culture and that mindset and that mind mentality to the New World. And they believe that they can trust them to be loyal to Spain, 100%. The people who are the Creoles, yes, they have Spanish blood in them, but they're born in the New World, so therefore they're kind of like once removed. Uh, and they don't trust them quite as much as they would trust the Peninsulares. So that's an important distinction to understand, and it will get the Spanish Empire into trouble later on in the 1800s when they have um, some revolutions down in Latin America and, and South America. Um, the rest of the social classes, you have mixed people, mestizos. You also have mixed um, mulattoes, which are African and um, Europeans, Native Americans and enslaved people. We'll get into this a little bit more in our next screencast uh, when we get introduced to some of these other groups that are in the New World. All right, that was kind of a long screencast, um, but we only have one more left. Uh, and so just look forward to it. We're going to have, we're just going to go through, um, you know, economic systems and kind of round out the Spanish colonial world and really end the time period 1492 to 1607.